for it. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's go ahead and praise the Lord like it's done. Jesus, we praise you, praise you, praise you. Word, 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 word your you. Hallelujah. Well, you might want to take this opportunity to be seated so we can go through these announcements. Now, if you're brand new here, we're glad you're here. We have um, these things called Connect Cards. They're in the, the pew in front of you. We'd ask that you fill that out and hand it to an usher or in, in the box out in the foyer. And uh, here's a few announcements. The youth are meeting this Wednesday in the gym at 7 p.m. There is also a brand new thing, a Christmas toy drive in partnership with Common Ground Ministries. Now here's two ways that you can that you can help with this. Number first, bring a new unwrapped toy for kindergarten through fifth grade is the age range and the deadline is December 9th. Now you know that's gonna get here quick. So today you can go out and get that little toy and, and bring it to the church next week. It'll be awesome. But here's another way you can help. You can donate to the outreach. Just mark your tithing envelope, toy drive. Or if you're giving online, you, all you got to do is, is put in the memo of the online giving toy drive, and it'll go straight to that. And so we'll have wonderful ways to give. Uh, and remember, if you're giving your offering today, the box to give in the offering is in the foyer, or you can always give online 24 hours a day. And uh, so, we're so glad you're here at First Assembly. Now Bryce is coming. Psalms 46 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Even though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling, there is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her. Just at the break of dawn, the nations raged, the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah.
and they're on their way to Cote d'Ivoire, which for us in English is the Ivory Coast, uh, to work with Brent and Shelley T. And they just got an announcement that they're fully funded, going to be leaving in February. Would you guys stand up and let us just honor you today? <laughs> Amen. We're so proud of you. And they do a great job. And uh, so for all of you that are watching online today, we welcome you to this service. I, I'll, I'll tell you, folks, I have felt the presence of the Lord in this room. I, I, I have felt the presence of the Lord. I had a little prayer going uh, for something I needed the Lord to just speak to me about, and it came during the worship time. And I just felt the presence of the Lord fill this room today. And so uh, what a joy to be with you here at First Assembly. And Elector, it's so good to see you. Please uh, send greetings to uh, uh, my dear friend, Randy Baker. Uh, my, we, we go back so many years. Uh, you see, before Nancy and I were married, my first uh, position on the staff was in uh, West Wego, New Orleans, New Orleans. And there was a lady named Lecter Cantrell that was the church organist. And she played for the choirs I directed it. It was our church organist. And uh, she married uh, Rennie Baker. And so, Lecter, we go back to about 1971. And uh, so uh, she was faithful and uh, organist and still playing today. So uh, have deep roots with this church. Amen. Amen. And I'll say how blessed you are to have Pastor Carl and Cindy Richard. Uh, you know, the, the pastor is the gift of Christ to the church. And when I go many times, my uh, position, I go and install pastors and, and churches, and I often preach a message entitled, The Gift That Just Keeps On Giving. Because in Ephesians 4, Christ gave the gift to the church, and one of those gifts is the pastor. And so uh, you're blessed to have a pastor that loves God, preaches the word, preaches Pentecost, preaches the power of healing, preaches the full gospel. Aren't you glad to have that? The full gospel, the full message for this age. And boy, do we ever need it now. We need to see the power of God. And folks, I just, I'm just i not preaching on that today, but I just believe the mighty visitation of the Holy Ghost is coming. And I want in on it. How about you? I want in on it. And uh, God, do it again. How interesting how the Lord confirms his ways. Because I preach in different places. Uh, as a matter of fact, I've got another place to be at 2 o'clock, another place to be at 6 o'clock tonight. And so each place has a different. But often when I'm uh, ministering, there will be something that kind of just verifies the word the Lord gave to me. A psalm, a verse of a psalm, or a scripture that's read, or a, a message in tongues, or something like that. I did not know today what your scripture of the day was, but the passage the Lord laid on my heart to bring with you today was Psalm 46. How about that? <laughs> and so you've already read it, so I'm just going to kind of preach on it and break it down today. And uh, let's ask God, help us, Lord, today. Help our beloved pastor and his wife as already we've prayed. But again, we ask that your precious healing power will flow into their bodies today. Raise them up and strengthen them to the glory of of your mighty name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Psalm 46, verses, uh, I'm going to start off just reading verses 11 and 12, and then I'm going to go back and show you something about this whole psalm. I'm reading from the New King James Version here. Be still and know that I am God. Now that's where we're going to end up today. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. And don't miss that little word, Selah. It could be a musical notation. It could be a Hebrew word that says pause and reflect. We're not sure exactly what it was used for, but all of those possibilities are there. And we'll see it in this psalm. So before we break it down, this was uh, Martin Luther's favorite psalm. As a matter of fact, it was from Psalm 46 that Martin Luther was inspired to write that great hymn of the church, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, a bulwark never failing. Well, Charles Spurgeon had this psalm as a favorite also, and he called it the psalm of holy confidence. I kind of like that, don't you? The psalm of holy confidence. This psalm refers to, and we're not sure exactly which episode, but I'm going to center around one, of an ancient city that is under a siege. 
often we don't have walls around our towns. Well, how could you do that around the Metroplex today? But in ancient cities, they built walls to protect, of course, from an attack of the enemy. And so those walls were the fortress. They were the security of the city. And so when an enemy would come in, he would surround the city and begin a siege, which I think is the setting of this particular psalm. I personally think that it would at least apply to the, the siege of the Assyrian army under the King Sennacherib when he came against uh, Jerusalem to destroy it and uh, during the days of King Hezekiah. Now I want you to come to feel this situation as we look at it and we'll get into it a little deeper in just in a moment and the Second Kings 19 is where you can read about that siege. Now before I get into the psalm and break it down, let me just say this to you. God's people were facing something that was overwhelming and was uh, all available resources were necessary to sustain their life. How many of you know that we learned that only God can really deliver us? The more trust you put in yourself and the less trust you put in God, the more trouble you're in. I'm telling you. And as a matter of fact, let me take that a little further. There are times God does not want us to be able to handle the problem. Now we pray and we believe God and we trust the Lord, but sometimes God says, I want to show you something. I want to show you my power. I want to show you that I can handle this even when your resources have dried up and there's not enough. My, gr my grandma, my mother's mother, was a great intercessor and prayer warrior. My, my grandpa uh, was a pioneer Pentecostal preacher but uh, Grandma stayed home, and she was kind of reserved and shy. She stayed home and raised 11 kids, so that kept her busy. But she would pray. Grandma was an intercessor. And, and I remember, as a boy, hearing Grandma pray. And she would say, simply in her country way, Oh, God, we're between a rock and a hard place. <laughs> she would say, God, we're up against it. Now, I know that wasn't really eloquent, but how many of you know the message got through? Have you ever felt that way? And that's kind of the way we may feel at times in our lives. So the psalm, let's look at it. This psalm is broken down into three parts. And to me, it has to do with the stages of the siege. And with each part, as we enter the finish that particular part, you're going to see the little word Selah. We go to the second part of the psalm. And after we go there, it's the little word Selah. And after the final part is, again, the word Selah. And that little word Selah, in those three places, kind of gives me the outline of this message. So let's by, go, begin by looking at verses 1 through 3. First of all, God is our present help in trouble. God is our present, on time, in time. God is our help in trouble. Look at verse 1 again. God is. How many of you say that? God is. God is. Not he was or he will be. God is our refuge and strength. A very present help. I want you to know. Now remember this because it's going to get a little darker from here. But the psalmist begins with that word. You know, he puts the first, the most important word as the first word in the first verse. God. I'll tell you, when I was pastoring my first pastor, I remember a lady calling me up one day, and she said, Pastor, it's tough, times are rough, times are hard. She says, Pastor, it's just come to prayer. Now, come on, did you get that? And I wanted to say, well, how about praying about that before it got so tough, you know? And but finally she, anyway, he says, God, that's the first word in the sentence, and I'm glad he put it there. God is a present help in the time of our trouble. Now the word refuge there means he is a rock of refuge. He is a safety. At this point in time, I want you to kind of put yourself inside the city and you're looking out over the walls and there is an enemy surrounding you that is threatening everything, your life, your culture, your family, your future. You're under attack and this is a deadly attack and so the people inside the city are, are thanking God that he is their refuge. 
The issue is that if the attacking enemy is stronger than the walls or stronger than the people defending the walls, then we're going to be in trouble. But as long as the walls stand and, the, and our forces are greater than the forces on the outside, then we have a refuge. And I'm telling you, no matter what's going on outside, when you and I have God on the inside, we have a refuge. Hallelujah. He is an ever-present help in the time of, uh, of trouble. So the city, the wall city, is the refuge. Israel had learned the hard way that they were at their, their refuge and their hope was not in how high the walls were or how thick the walls were or how many uh, soldiers were on the wall. Their security was in the God who was with them inside the city. Hallelujah. Israel at this time, the city of Jerusalem is facing an attack of overwhelming forces of the first really great world empire at that time, the king of Assyria. And the Assyrian soldiers were brutal. They were known as some of the most brutal soldiers of, uh, and armies that marched. They impaled their victims. They literally skinned their victims alive. It was from the impaling of the Assyrian forces that later the Romans were to take that were to refine it into what we know as crucifixion. So when these people came around, it was a serious day. Not only are they a threat, they are a very forceful and potent threat. But Israel has a hope. God is our refuge. I think that's why that Martin Luther wrote in that word, he said, a mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amidst the floods of mortal ill prevailing. Hallelujah. Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Can somebody say praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm going to skip the next verse so you'll know. The word trouble, we have the word refuge, and the word trouble is a tight place. Remember Grandma's prayer? We're up against it. We're between a rock and a hard place. And so when the time of trouble, to be hemmed in, to be under duress, to not know which way to turn. I, I want you to feel what these people are feeling as they see the threat that is against the city that they are in. The psalmist, as a matter of fact, gives us a taste of that in verses 2 and 3. When he writes about it, when he says, therefore, we will not fear. Now, he said, he's getting ready to describe the upheaval of emotion, the trouble that they're experiencing, the emotional overwhelming trouble when he says this, even though the earth be removed and the mountains be cast into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling, Selah. So what he's describing here, he says, listen, when your world is literally turned upside down, when everything that you have believed in and hoped in is being shaken, and suddenly you're looking and you're panicking and you're not sure what is going to happen in the future and what you thought might happen didn't happen and things you didn't know were going to happen happened and so now you see that's what he's describing here. He said, you know, God is my refuge but there's times when I feel overwhelmed. There's times when I don't know what tomorrow is going to hold. And then he says, think about this, Selah. So that's the first part of this psalm. You know, there's an old song, and I feel like to sing it, Brother David. When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. Hallelujah. How many know that old song? When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. I'm telling you, he will do that too as well. Amen. So the Assyrians are attacking the city. It is a terrible threat. Now Hezekiah at this time, Hezekiah receives a threat from one of the high officers of the king of Assyria. It's in 2 Kings chapter 19 and verse number 32. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, this king of Assyria, Sennacherib, has sent to Hezekiah a threat basically saying, you've had it, you might as well give up because we're going to just obliterate you. It was a very, I'm not reading all the letter, but it was a threat and the king's heart melted. As a matter of fact, King Hezekiah fell apart. And then he sends a letter to the prophet Isaiah, and he reads the letter, and there's a whole lot here I'm not reading. But finally, Isaiah sends back a note to the king, and he says, listen, here's the word of the Lord, 2 Kings 19. Therefore says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, 
nor come before it with a shield, nor build a siege around it against it. By the way that he came, by the same he shall return. He shall not come into this city, says the Lord, for I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. Somebody say, praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. God says, I'm going to defend this city, and I want you to know God is with you. So he is your help in time of trouble. Selah. <laughs> I don't know what you're going through today. I don't know what you're going through, but I do know a God who cares and a God who loves you and he's got it under control. How many of you glad he's got it under control? Amen. The second part of this Psalm begins in verse numbers four through seven. It's the second thing I want to tell you that God is our source of refreshing in trouble. So he's, he's with us in time of trouble, but he's with us to refresh us in trouble. I love verse number four. Now we're four through seven is the second part. There is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. There is a river. Hey, what Pentecostal couldn't read that and get happy? What Pentecostal couldn't get to talking about the, we know a river, don't we? <laughs> but let's, let's talk about it a minute. Did you know that the cities of the ancient world, the great cities, were built either on a river or at least a large water supply, perhaps by an ocean or something. They were built on a river. Cairo's built on the Great Nile River, Vienna, Austria on the Danube River, the Beijing, China on the Yellow River, London, England on the Thames River, Paris, France on the Seine River, Rome, Italy on the Tiber River, and on and on and on it can go. However, it's interesting that Jerusalem is one of the great cities of the world that does not have a river. It's amazing. But it does have water. And from inside the city, there is something that's been there for years, not for, for the way, from the creation, the Gihon Springs, with great sources of river flowing into the city. And then during this very siege of the king of Assyria, if that's what this psalm's referring to, King Hezekiah cut a tunnel to bring water into the city. And you can still go down and walk through that tunnel today. There's still water flowing into the city. And I've seen it. I didn't walk through it, but I stood right there looking at the tunnel. So inside the city, there was a source of water that was sustaining the city even in time of siege. And so in this psalm, it says there is a river. You have to have water and food if you're going to survive a siege. And he says, there is a river that flows inside that city. It wasn't like any other river. It was a river flowing within, in that water. You can have the, you had the, the, uh, the, the pool of Siloam and you had the pool of Bethesda. So there's water in the city. But let me turn from that to tell you that today there is a river that flows from God into the life of every believer who has their hope in God. It is, the, it is the river that Jesus spoke about in John chapter 7, verses 37 through 39. Oh, everyone that is thirsty, come unto me and drink. He said, out of his innermost being are going to flow rivers of living water. Hallelujah. You see, in the middle of your trouble, in the middle of your battle, in the middle of your time of COVID, Pastor, there is a refreshing from the Holy Spirit that is coming through you today. And it refreshes you when everything on the outside is saying destruction and threat and trouble and hardship and uncertainty. Inside of you, the river flows. The Holy Spirit arises in His mighty refreshing work. Hallelujah! And he refreshes our soul. Hallelujah. I'm here to tell you the joy of the Lord is your strength this morning. Wow. Isaiah 44 verse 3. I think is that really what Jesus was talking about when he said as the scripture says. He said I will pour water on him who is thirsty and floods on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. Glory be to God. People say how can you be so happy in time of trouble? How can you have a smile on your face when we're walking through something like we've walked through before these last eight or nine months? I'm telling you, because what's in you is greater than what's outside of you. The glory of the Lord, the power of God, the river of God is inside of you. And we can rejoice and we can be glad. Oh, do we feel the pressure around us? Sure we do. And then sometimes it does cause us to be concerned. But then the, the Lord has some good things to say to us. Uh, 
I like that old song we used to sing. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory. Whew, hallelujah. Come on, church, let's just stop and rejoice. Come on. We're in the house of God today and just begin to rejoice. Hallelujah. The joy of the Lord is your strength today. Somebody needs to know that. You need to refresh in your life this morning. Some of you have been under a load and you've been worried and there have been problems. I'm not telling you that a believer's life isn't full of problems, but I can tell you the one that's been controlling the problem. And he's the one. He says, I'm going to refresh you even in times of trouble, the river. So in the middle of the siege, in the middle of the trouble, the people know that there's enough water flowing into that city. They're not going to run out of water because there's rivers, internal rivers that flow. Isn't that beautiful? But he's not quite through here um, talking about this in the second part of the psalm. For in verse number, the third thing I would tell you is God is positioned in the middle of your trouble. Uh, God is positioned in the middle of your trouble. You say, where is God? Yeah, he's, right, he's right there in the middle of the trouble. He's, he's right there with you. Look at verse number five. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her. And put your name in there. Just at the break of dawn. The nations raged, the kingdoms were moved, he uttered his voice, the earth melted, the Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge, Selah, hallelujah. Isn't that good, isn't that good news today? God is in the midst of, of us. He is helping us. That's, that's, that's the hope we have this morning. Glory to God. He is here to help you. Some of you may have come into this room today or you're watching online and, and, and life's been pretty heavy and there have been some concerns and I know you're a believer and if you're not a believer, we want you to become a believer today and we'll pray and ask God to touch you in just a few moments here. But there's news you need to know. I know God is with me. He is my helper. Even when I'm down, He's a glory to God. He's not abandoned the throne. Jesus is Lord this morning, church. And someday the king is going to come and the kingdom is going to come and everything else going on in this world is going to be changed. Yeah. Hallelujah. People want to bring change. I'm telling you, Jesus is going to bring a glorious change. God is positioned in the middle of your trouble. So there is a river. God's in the middle of your, of your trouble. And that's the second stanza of this. In the pressure of troubling times, we're prone to ask, where is God at all? Mary and Martha had that problem. When their brother got sick, they sent Jesus word saying, your, your friend, Lazarus, is sick. How many of you know that God's ways are above our ways and his thoughts are above our thoughts? Now Jesus is only 20 miles away from where Mary and Martha are, the word Lazarus is. And probably about a good hard day's walk. It would take me a little longer, but the disciples walked all the time. Jesus didn't go. He waited, as you know, until arriving on the fourth day. And finally the disciples said, aren't you going to go? And he says, no. And they said, Lazarus is, is uh, sick. And then they said, well, Lord, if he's sick, then go and, go and pray for him that he, that he can be well. And finally Jesus said, no, he's dead. He's, he's asleep and he's talking about death. And there had to be some confusion there that Jesus waited till arriving on the fourth day when he could have gotten there and probably arrived in time to save Lazarus. I'm talking about the timing of God. I'm talking about God being in the middle of your trouble. And uh, when he gets there, oh, the sisters, the first sister comes and says, Lord, if you had been here, our brother would not have died. Now that's faith, right? And then this other sister says, Lord, I know that he will rise in the resurrection. Now Jesus wept. He felt the pain and he felt the loss. And I think when Jesus wept, it doesn't mean he just shed a little tear down his face. There was serious weeping going on. As Jesus, I think, felt the sorrow and the pain 
that's going on in this world and that he's going to take care of at the cross. But then comes that moment when he says to, the, to Mary, I am the resurrection and the life. Roll the stone away. Hallelujah. Roll the stone away. And then with a commanding voice, listen to me, church. It's that voice that is one day going to sound and is going to bring the shout and every righteous dead is going to come out of their grave and gather together in the clouds and be reunited with their soul and we're going to catch them in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Hallelujah. It's one thing for Jesus to have healed Lazarus. And we have another story in the inspired scripture. That's the healing power of Jesus. But it's another thing when he waits till the fourth day and the man's been in the grave. And the, even the sisters say, Lord, he's already decomposing. He even speaks. But Jesus said, roll the stone away. Lazarus, come forth. It's another thing when he says, let me show you. Not only do I have the power over sickness, I have the power over death. And Lazarus got up and came out. Hallelujah, hallelujah. He's right there in the middle of your trouble. He is the God who knows what you're going through. And you may have a situation. I like what T.D. Jake said some time ago when he said, your miracle is in your mess. <laughs> hallelujah. I know I'm not off a of psalm here. I'm just going a couple of different. I'm just chasing another rabbit. No, I'm not really. When the disciples were on the storm and they're toiling and they, they're hopeless, they think they're going to die. Where was Jesus? He waited till 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and then he just looked out could see him toiling and rowing. How did he see him in the storm? How did he see him with the wind and the waves and the rain and the darkness and, the, and all of that going on? But he saw through all of that. And then Jesus said, all right, it's time. They're about ready to give up. And so he just stepped off the shore and stepped on the first wave and walked right out to where they were in that boat. And then they saw the power of God. Oh, listen, he's with you in your time of trouble. And there is no trouble too great for the Jesus that I'm preaching to you about today because he's already conquered death, hell, and the grave. Hallelujah. He's got it all under control. God is in the midst of her. She will not fail. Oh, Jesus. Don't let the devil. I, I feel really quickened right now. Don't let the enemy start talking in your ear defeat and destruction and hopelessness and give up and quit because it's just going to get darker. Don't you believe that? Don't you listen to that? Because Jesus is the truth and the way and the life. He has control over the storm. I can't tell you the winds won't blow and the, and the, and the waves get high sometimes. And it's in those moments where, where God says, let me show you what I can do. Because in the middle of your trouble, he's going to show up the mighty God. Hallelujah. And then we come to the last part of this psalm. Therefore, is God is in control of our trouble. God is in control. He's in the middle of it. He gives you refreshing in it, and he is in control. Let's look at the last part of this psalm for a moment. Now, this is the setting for me, verses 8 through 11. And this is that, at this point, the siege has been broken. So I see this part of the psalm as after the siege is broken. By the way, if you want to go back and read the story, let me tell you how the siege was broken. How many of you read Isaiah's letter to the city? They'll not get in here. And in one night, in one night, one of the most astounding stories of the Old Testament, an angel of the Lord killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. Now, I believe that book's inspired, and I believe the words in it are true. That suddenly, the threat is over. And the Bible says, I'm going to send that king back into his own country. As a matter of fact, when he gets back, when he got back to his own country, he heard a rumor and left and went back there and got killed. God said, listen, he's Sennacherib may have all these soldiers, but listen, one angel... <laughs> One angel took care of the problem that night. And so the siege has been broken. So now you look out over the walls and, the, and, and all you see are these dead bodies uh, and the enemy's gone away and the threat has ended. And that's why I think the psalmist says, Come behold the works of the Lord in verse 8. 
who has made desolations in the earth. He makes war cease on the end of the earth. I think he's talking about this situation, but someday, thank God, all of war is going to cease. He's going to be king of kings. But I got to go on. He breaks the bow and he cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in the fire. Hallelujah. What's he, what's he talking about? He's talking about the victory that has just been won for the people of God by the power and the authority of God. Of God. Hey, listen, I don't, when you go home, get your calculator out. Don't do it now. But I just want you to figure something up. If one angel could destroy 185,000 Assyrians, and Jesus said, I can call 12 legions of angels, and that was three to 6,000 men, you multiply it up, each one of those 3,000 times 12 or 6,000 times 12 times 185,000, I'm telling you, all power and authority is given to the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But I want to come to verse 10. This is a powerful verse. Be still and know that I am God. Would you just say those words with me? Be still and know that I am God. After this siege, after this warfare, after the threat, the sea and the waves roaring, the winds, the threat, all of it. Suddenly we have this wonderful word. That's in the New King James Version. The New Living Translation says, be silent and know that I'm God. Today's English Version says, stop fighting, he says, and know that I'm God. I want to just talk to you about those words before we pray this morning. I think what he's saying to us is that when we're going through trouble and things that seem out of control, that we need to learn to quit struggling. If we believe that God is our refuge and strength, then even when we are tested and we are, we sometimes agonize over the situations of life and there is suffering and there is trouble. But if we can teach our spirit to say, I don't know what's the result of this, but I know a God who says, you need to put your trust in me. Let me, let me unpack that for you just a minute. It's time for us to try and stop. Have you ever tried to work things out yourself? I'm going to teach you an old West Texas word because that's where I was raised in Odessa, Texas. There's a word that we often used to use called finagling. In some parts of the country it's called finagling. How many know what I'm talking about? You're trying to figure it out, and you're trying to work it out. And I'll be honest with you, I used to get in trouble when I finagle something. The younger generation here says, what kind of word is that? Well, it's probably not a dictionary, but it's where you're trying to fix it. You're trying to fix it. Don't ever tell God, I've got this under control, <laughs> because you don't have it under control. Can I give you one illustration of this from another man in the Bible, and then we come to, to this finish? Elijah the prophet has been using mightily of God, hasn't he? Call fire out of heaven. I mean, he's prayed. The rains have stopped. And now fire's coming. He's run back to Jezreel in the rain. I mean, this man has poured his life into this revival for three and a half years. And then when he gets back to Jezreel, Ahab gets there and tells Jezebel what's happening. And she says, 24 hours from now, he's going to be like those prophets he killed on the top of Mount Carmel. I've stood on the top of Mount Carmel. It's an impressive place. I've seen where Elijah stood. Did all. So Elijah hears about it. And he just runs. He literally panics. He runs. And in the human side, I can't hardly blame him because he's tired. He's been running. He's killed 800, 400 prophets of Baal. He's, he's been praying and all this and now and now he's just like, God, I just might as well die. Stay with me here, sir. And so God, there's several steps I don't have time to go into. Finally, God gets him to Horeb and in a cave there. And Elijah, what are you doing here? And Elijah pours out his complaint. 
He said, I tried and I couldn't do it. I'm no better than my father. Let me die. And then God sends the wind, and he sends an earthquake, and he sends a fire. But it says in each one of those, God wasn't in the wind. God wasn't in the earthquake. God wasn't in the fire. He had been in the fire before, but he wasn't in the fire this time. And then there is this still, small voice. I love it. And this is kind of what I see God doing. Is uh, sitting down with Elijah. Because Elijah's in a tizzy. How many of y'all know what a tizzy is? <laughs> Let me die! He was so frustrated. Exasperated. Weary. Fearful. And in that still small voice, this is what I think, if I can put it in my version of the Bible. Now, Elijah, settle down. Elijah, this isn't about you. It's about me. Elijah, you're wanting to die. But uh, Elijah, your greatest ministry is just ahead. So Elijah, I'm going to send you back. You're going to anoint your successor. His name's Elisha. And he's going to pick up your mantle someday. And he is going to do more miracles than you've ever done. And I'm going to send you back to anoint Jehu to be the king of Israel. And he's going to take care of Jezebel. And I'm going to anoint you to anoint Haziel, the king of Syria. And he will do my work. So he says, Elijah, just settle down. You did what I called you to do. And now this isn't about you, it's about me. And I want every one of you here to hear, be still and know that I'm God. Because you see, if we run around, what are we going to do? Oh, what are we going to do? It's all hopeless. The sky is falling. Everything's falling apart. What are we going to do? God says, listen, I have seasons and I have times to do the work that I do. And there are times when you won't understand what I'm doing, but I never give up. I never quit. He is the God who is control in control of your trouble, my friend. And Elisha, he said, and I didn't finish this while ago, but God said to Elijah, he said, I feel God 7,000 that haven't bowed their knee to Baal. It's not over. I know the season may look a little rough, but it's not over. I am the God of creation, and I've got it all under control, Elijah. So don't be so frustrated. Be still and know that I'm God doesn't mean to be inactive. It doesn't mean to just sit back and do nothing. We do everything God has called us to do. We, we apply ourselves to his work. But what, it, what it means is that we yield it to God. And we say, God, I've got to put this in your hands. Your will and your purposes, I don't always understand. I don't understand the timing. I don't understand the seasons. But I know that you're the God who operates in absolute righteousness and absolute holiness and absolute perfection. And I know you're in control. Right now, I don't see it. I don't understand it. I feel frustrated, Lord. But you're the God that I put my trust in. And I believe God is saying something to some of you here today. He's saying, now listen, be still, settle down. You can't fix it. You may not be able to change it, but I can. Be still, and you're going to, now listen, listen, listen. Okay, well, I'm listen. listen. He said, be still. And no, you're going to learn something you didn't see before. Church, we're going to learn something in the days ahead that we haven't seen before. We're going to learn that he is God. 
be still and know that I am. Hallelujah. I am. The great name of God here to Moses at the bush. The name of Jesus. Say I am. Is with you. Be still and know that I am God. Hallelujah. Church, he will share his glory with no one. He will manifest his power. He will bring forth his kingdom. Let me tell you, the battle has already been won. Jesus is Lord. Death is defeated. Sin has been forgiven. And the powers of darkness have already been broken. They are still trying to show themselves in this world and all the evil going on around this world. But I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he's living whatever man may say. Be still. The Holy Spirit speaking to everyone. I don't care how young or old you are. And if I could sit down in front of every one of you little sweet faces and take your face in my hands and I would say, David, be still and know that I am God. I could go around this room and just say, listen, settle down. Don't be worrying. Don't be fretting. Don't be overly concerned. Don't sit at home and worry and be frustrated because God is with you. Sila, Sila, Sila. Hallelujah. Think about it. Be comforted by it. That is what I think this psalm says to us. After the battle's over, even though the victory's been won and the enemy's been defeated, God says, I'm with you. Hallelujah. I want to pray for you this morning. I want to pray. I don't know. You know, I, I miss the times when we really can gather up close and be close. And I do respect protocols and I, I do respect that. I respect people's health, but God's not limited by space, is he? So I'm going to ask you to stand right now with me. David, would you come back? And everybody, if you don't feel like standing, you don't have to. That's not a problem. But I feel the presence of God in this room. I don't know what the struggle may be in your life today. It may be physical. It may be emotional. It may be problems that family work, just what, wherever it comes from. Maybe just the whole condition of the country. Just all the turmoil that's been going on even before the elections. We need to pray for our country, don't we? But today, if you have a need in your life, if you need healing in your body, I'm just going to ask you, just, just put your hand on, on your body. If you can put it where your problem is, do it now. If you can't, just put your hand on your body. If you need inner healing, if you've been struggling with stress and depression and anxiety, just put your hand on just right here on your heart. If you've got a need in your life today, a situation that I haven't even touched on, you know what you can do? You can just kind of stretch your hands out and say, Lord, i got a problem. <laughs> but I want to present it to you. I'm going to present it to you. And I'm going to trust you to meet the need because God has come here today to say, listen, I want you to know that I am with you. I haven't forgotten about you. And I have already moved to meet your need today. And we're going to receive it because Jesus is in this place. Hallelujah. Amen. Jesus is in this place. And I want you to get ready to receive. I want you to get I'm going to pray. And as I pray, I'm going to believe God to touch you. Listen, I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe Jesus is a healer. I believe he's a restorer. I believe he's all that you need. And I want to pray in faith. And I want God to touch you this morning. Are you ready? Will you receive it from the Lord? Not from me. I don't heal. Jesus is the healer. And in the name of Jesus, I'm going to pray. You get ready. You believe with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, I come to you in this Sunday morning service. God, again, I pray you touch Pastor Richard right now. Stretch through this camera into that room and to where he is and touch him and touch Sister Cindy today. May they feel in this moment a change. Hallelujah. Folks, I don't mean to be proud, but I feel an authority upon this prayer that you touch these people in this room right now. Heal, heal, heal the infirmities of your people. I pray in the name of Jesus, those that are dealing with emotional struggles and stress and anxiety, deliver them from that oppression right now. 
God, for the other knees that are extended to you in the name of Jesus, do your work now, Lord. Let peace come where there's been str tr struggle. Let there be calm where there has been duress. Come, Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus across this room. The power, the power, the power of Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 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 Church, worship the Lord. Lift up your voice. Come on, it's a beautiful time. Receive right now. This is a moment of activity. This is a moment of activity. An impartation of the power of Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Jesus, Jesus is all I need. Listen, the Holy Spirit is here doing a real work. He's touching you this morning. Hallelujah. We're not just going through motions today. We're interacting with a living Jesus who's reaching down now to minister to you. He's all I need. Hallelujah. You worship God. You're going to know something's happening right now. You're going to know something's happening. He's all I need. What God do for you today? I took a hard fall last month or so, and I was still having some muscle spasms over my body, and this arm was hurting, but praise God, it doesn't hurt anymore. <laughs> so the Lord has healed your left arm today. So yeah. Can you give birth? Come on, Lord. Come on, let's pray. Thank you. What the Lord do for you this morning, Lord? He's giving me peace in the middle of the storm that's going on in our country and in our lives. My sister just had brain surgery. He's giving me peace over that. And, and I just feel, just my soul is just filled up. I, I just praise God. Thank you for all Amen. This. Can we give God praise for peace? God, thank you. God bless you. Don't go away either. Praise the Lord. What did the Lord do for you all this morning? Well, I, about a year and a half ago, I had double bypass So, yes, so this is what happened to you this morning? The burden has been lifted. Okay, you just don't feel any pressure there anymore, huh? Amen. The Lord touched you in a way. Anything happen to you this morning? 
Just a little bit. Pardon? Just a piece about it, okay? Can we give the Lord praise? Thank you. Thank you, Lord, praise. God bless you. God bless you, man. What's your name? Isaac, what did God do for you today? Uh, he uh, gave me peace to uh, all the storm and what's going on in his school and all that. And so he just gave you uh, a stillness in your spirit. Just kind of settle down. Don't worry about it, right? Can we believe that's the work of the Holy Spirit? Amen. God bless you, man. What the Lord do for you today? He gave me peace amongst all of the confusion and upsetting things that have happened. And I can't praise him enough <laughs> for healing this hurt that's been there for months. And I am completely free. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That bird is lifted. God bless you, honey. God bless you. What the Lord do for you this morning? <laughs> when you first came into church today, you felt that burden lift. Well, why not? Where the yoke is broken, where there's an anointing, right? God bless you, honey. God bless you. Come on, let's give the Lord praise. I believe Jesus is in the house. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. Well, I know we're going to have to get out of here. We've got to sing it one more time, Brother David. He's all I need. He's all I need. Praise the Lord. We thank you again and be blessed today. 